say that you are my God. You're all together lovely, all together worthy, yeah. all together wonderful. You're wonderful to me. And we welcome you to tonight's study as we uh, go into the Word of God. And I believe that uh, the message tonight, as it ought to be with every message, uh, is prophetic to us in relation to the activities that's taking place around us, so that we as the people of God will know how to prepare ourselves and the posture that we ought to take as God's people. Tonight I'm using as a subject, and this is really uh, the messages dovetail into each other. I'm going to talk about the identity of God and man. And as we read a scripture that is familiar here in Psalm 8 and verse 3, I'm going to give you several scriptures. Tonight being Bible study, we're going to do some in-depth study tonight through the Word of God as we look at how the Word of God addresses our issues of today. It says here in Psalm 8, verse 3, uh, when I consider your heavens, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? For you made him a little lower than the angels and you have crowned him with glory and honor. You've made him to have dominion over the works of your hands. You put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, even the beasts of the field, the birds of the air, the fish of the sea that pass through the paths of the sea. And then it concludes by saying, O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. So when we read the scripture, it speaks of man 
in the beginning, and first of all, the consideration of God's creation. But when we talk about creation, we must first consider the creator God. Uh, when we say, what is man? Before we get to that part, uh, let's identify God. Who is God? God as creator. Thinking about this, think about this for a moment. God who is creator. God who created all things. Everything that exists, God created it. And when it talks about this, it says, when I consider the heavens. Now, it didn't just say when I consider heaven, because then we would think primarily about heaven as being the place that we would one day occupy, believers would one day occupy, are the heavens that we see, the stars of the sky, and the things that were mentioned within this particular scripture. But it didn't say just the heaven, but it said the heavens. That, that's very important to emphasize the fact that it says the heavens. When it speaks about the heavens, one way of, of, of defining that is to say, when I consider the galaxy, and let's pluralize that, when we consider the galaxies, when we give consideration to all the galaxies that exist and the ones that we have yet to discover, recent discoveries uh, of, of planets and galaxies taking place even through uh, exploration. But then when we speak of this particular scripture, we are saying that in recent, more is being considered than before. When I consider, and then we bring science in, I consider what was known, and then I consider what is what was known, what is being made known, and what is yet to be discovered, we realize that God as creator, all we're really doing is discovering that which God had created. And we are, even when we have things revealed to us, we are discovering what God already knows. That's important to understand both of this. We are, we are really discovering what God had already created. And we are tapping into what God already knows. So recent discoveries will bring us to the place of understanding that there are many things yet not given full consideration because those things had not, those areas had not been discovered. And the insights that we are receiving now, these things beforehand had not been known. So now when we talk about the things that are being discovered and giving consideration. Let's stop there for a moment. When I consider the heavens, now we look at what are we discovering? We look at our dependency upon uh, what is taking place above us, the airwaves, satellites that uh, have been sent to uh, space. And as a result of it, now we are dependent upon networks, uh, the, the signals that we're getting, even to be able to broadcast to you tonight has to do with a signal that is uh, being sent down or beamed down from a satellite. When we consider all of that, and when I consider, look at, look at this, the vastness of all of God's creation. Uh, and, and, and then when we really begin to think about it, because we think, in fact, the way it's being described, they just call it space, just space. Because there's no, you see, there are places and, and, and then they call it space because it talks about the vastness of all that is yet out there. So now, when we consider that, then we look at the smallness of the Earth. The Earth as being a small planet within this particular galaxy. If you really begin to look at all of God's creation, it's just like a little pin uh, point in the midst of all of God's creation. That's the smallness of the Earth. But then... It didn't just stop there. We look at what God is saying. He says, we consider all of these things, uh, the heaven, the moon, the stars, uh, which you have ordained that all of these things remain in their proper place and that you hold them in their orbit. You maintain them in their proper place. But then the question is, what is man? This little finite creature when you look at this small speck that's called the earth, and then you hone in on this little creature, one creature that's occupying this particular space, 
what is this man who inhabits the earth? Uh, that's where that question arises. What is man, or, and, and put it this way, what is mankind that you are mindful of here, that you pay special attention to that little creature that exists in that little space that's called the earth? Now, listen to what God is really saying. He said, out of all of God's creation, out of all the things that are yet being discovered, all the things within the universes, the universes that are known and the universes that are not known, that God will begin to hone in on little creatures that exist upon this little speck called the earth. And he says, now, what is so important about man or mankind that you have given him special attention, that your focus is upon him above all the other things that have been made. In fact, what I'm emphasizing tonight is that all of these things that God's created, all the all of the planets, all of the universes, all, all of the galaxies that's there, it has an effect upon this little creature that's called man. God is still focusing his attention upon man. So what is man that you are mindful of him and that you will arrange or rearrange all of your creation to suit or to fit him? What is this man that you're mindful of him? And then it says, and the son of man, that you would visit him, that you would come in, and it talks about visit, that you would come in the form of a man. This is God in flesh, that you will come to the earth in order to visit mankind through the person of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So with that, that's a whole lot to think about, exploring uh, uh, all of these things. And then when we think about it, uh, I'm not going to get into the part about uh, uh, the rest of it. It talks about how he has made us a little lower than the halo, halo him or the angels. But the question that I want to focus our attention in on is this. If that be the case, we talk about mankind, I'm going to be more specific and more personal. Who am I? And, and, and then let's even make it personal to you. Who are you? And that's what we're looking at. Who is this individual, because we look at man as a collective, we look at man as a corporate being, but then we begin to look at man as a personal, an individual, a personal being. Who am I? You can get lost in the crowd. You can get lost. You talk about all of the galaxies. Look at the vastness of God and, and the greatness of God, how a little individual can get lost in all of this. But let me tell you something. This God who has the knowledge and, and, and who created all that exists and all that is yet being discovered, he still pays special attention to you as an individual. But the question is, who am I? Who are you? And, and as a result of it, we begin to see people going through uh, what's called identity crisis. And, 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 and then as a result of this identity crisis, one person that's trying to, uh, uh, to, to know himself and and to prove himself, to define himself. And then you see another person who's trying to know himself and prove himself and define himself or herself. And then we see these cultural clashes that take place within the culture today as it is happening even here and now. Uh, uh, the thing that we have to understand is this, you were made for a purpose. You were made for a purpose. God had a purpose in mind when he made you. In other words, he made you uniquely you because there was a place within all of God's creation for you to function as God would have you to function. Now, let's break it down so you can begin to look at the value of the individual. For God, uh, as we begin to look at, I would say, the, the order and the arrangement that God has established for us uh, is from God. It's from purpose. Listen to this now. I want you to pay attention to this. It is from purpose to principle. It is from principle to power. Principles to power. And it is from power to the problems. Now, now when I talk about this, it is from God's purpose for your life. We talk about identity. The great God who made all things, he has a specific plan and purpose for your life. So now what happens, we discover God's plan so that we may know our purpose. 
what is God's plan? What is God's overall plan for humanity so that we can discover our purpose within the framework of God's purpose for all humanity? But then in that, it is from that purpose to principles. There are principles that must govern our lives, principles that must but must be directed. They are the directors for our lives so that we function as we ought to function. But then as we come under those principles are guided, we talked about guidelines and we talked about the, the parameters established by God, why God would set those things up. It is from principle to power as we strive lawfully. When we are at a place where we're willing to do things God's way, then we're postured for God to manifest his strength and his power through us. You see, you want God's power. You see, if you get it wrong, you say, I want the power before you understand the purpose. If you want the power before you understand the principles, you want the principles before you understand the purpose. If you get this thing all mixed up, then there's no way for you to function the way God wants you to function. So it has to be this way. Listen to me carefully. It has to be from God's purpose uh, uh, to principles. If we talk about God's purpose, to God's principles or God's word, understanding God's word, understanding what God has established. He, and we're going to get into this deeper, what God's word is all about. And it's from those principles that we now are postured to exercise his power rightly. But then it's from that power that we can rightly interpret the problem. So now it is pretty much like, I think it was one evangelist say, he said, uh, talk about, uh, we don't have any problem. I think it was Schambach. He said, you don't have any problems. All you need is faith in God. Uh, he was really saying is that the problems we have in life uh, are, are really there because there are certain things that are unknown to us. So therefore, they become problems to us. But understand, we talk about the purpose of God, principles of God, the power of God, and then we come to the problem. But most people begin with the problem before they come to understand that there is an answer that preceded the problem before the problem even existed. So now my personhood is defined by this. Who am I? I'm that person that has a purpose and my purpose actually gives definition to who I am. This is who I am. I have a purpose. Uh, our granddaughter, she has, uh, has a little book that in her, and a part of that, I have a purpose. She's learning that even at her age. But that's something all of us need to learn. You have a purpose. God has a purpose for your life. He has an intention for your life. And his objective is for you to fulfill your purpose, your life's purpose. So now, when, when we align ourselves this way, then we give God permission uh, we give God permission to get involved in every area of our lives. We give God permission. We say, now, Lord, I invite you. And I'm going to bring some scripture in here after a while to help you understand this. We give God permission to be involved in every aspect of our lives. We say, Lord, I invite you in so that you can be who you are within me. Now, I'm giving you an overview now, but we're going to hone in after a while. Now, listen to what he's saying here. We invite God in. We say, Lord, you have my permission. When purpose is not primary, then the lack of purpose becomes our greatest problem. You see, when purpose is not primary, when the, our, when, when the God's purpose for our lives is not our primary purpose, you see, then the lack of purpose becomes your greatest problem. You say, what is your problem? Your problem is that you're living your life without purpose. What is the purpose? What is the intent? You breathe God's air. You, you enjoy God's blessings. Everything, the day that God has given us, this is the day. Well, I said in one message, I said, this is the day that God has made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. But he made the day for us, and he made us for the day. This is not coincidental that we're born in this day, this hour, because we were born for this. We were born to occupy this time and space at this particular time. So now, as we think about it, uh, uh, what God does, he brings us a place where we, we uh, continue to move into understanding the purpose of God all the more. When, uh, see, what happened, God begins to reveal, I would call this progressive revelation. We talked about it Sunday, the progressive revelation of Jesus Christ, how Christ, uh, the word of God reveals more and more 
uh, of who Christ is so we understand more and more of who we are. The more we know of him, the more we know of ourselves. We say because we understand what is man what, and who, what is the son of man that you would visit him. So through the revelation of Christ, we come to know who we are because our lives are hidden in him. So the purpose of Christ, the reason that Christ came upon the earth, we are here to fulfill that purpose. We are the continuation of the work of Christ upon the earth. Now, 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 when we talk about that, we talk about, now that's true progressives. We talk about progressive politically, but the true progressives are those that go in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord, because here we become productive individuals and we're producing after our own kind, but we're producing after his own kind. That was the dominion mandate. He told us the work of God from creation. What did God say? After he created man, he said, he said to man in Genesis 1, 26, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth. But before he said, he said, let us make man, what? It, it make man in our image, according to our likeness. Let us make man in our image and after our likeness. He said, let's make man so that man, we'll talk about image and likeness, what, uh, so that he expresses that which is of me. That's what he's really saying that he will give expression to that which is of me. He said, and then let him have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps and uh, upon the earth. So God created man in his own image, his own image. In the image of God, he created him male and female who created them. So now he speaks of mankind and he brings in the two aspects of man, maleness and femaleness in order to give a full expression of who he is. Now we talk about identity being lost. It, it, it is, I'll get to that to understand even how the enemy comes in to destroy the very image of Christ. But he says, now and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the air, the birds of the air, uh, uh, the fish of the sea rather, the birds of the air, over every creeping thing or every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, this is what I was thinking about. I was thinking about that when you begin to read the dominion mandate, that's what it's called. But let me just take a part of that and look at what God was doing. He placed man in a garden. He placed man in a garden, but yet the dominion mandate was that he was to be fruitful and multiply to fill the whole earth and subdue it but he placed him in the Garden of Eden. He said, so he says, so in this garden, this is your proving ground. This is your testing station. He said, within the garden, I want you to be fruitful in the garden. I want you to multiply in the garden. I want you to, uh, sub to feel and subdue what is to be fulfilled and subdued within the Garden of Eden. That's all you say, but, but that wasn't the whole dominion mandate. He said the whole earth, but at that particular time, his assignment was specifically to do what he was to ultimately do upon the whole earth within the garden. Now, this is what he's saying here. He said it was all to be done within the garden. Take authority over every creeping thing that creep at. Now, that serpent was a creep, wasn't he? He said, so you were to take authority over that which was creeping at that particular time. He said, so now, if you pass the test, within the garden, then you're being postured to begin to eventually take what you've learned in the garden to subdue things all over the earth. But if you fail in the garden, you're going to fail even in subduing things all over the earth. But then even when we talk about his earthly assignment, that still wasn't God's ultimate. God would ultimately give man, is to give man, the responsibility to have authority over all of his creation. Now, now, now you, you say, well, what are you saying here? I'm talking about all of the galaxies, all of the things that had been discovered and yet to be discovered. The, the, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that, uh, that you uh, would actually visit him because you have given him dominion over all? And in that, uh, you begin to, your, your objective was to glorify, be glorified through him 
as he was oper operating that dominion. Let me give you a scripture to back this up. First Corinthians chapter six and verse two. He says, do you not know that the saints will judge the world? And if the world will be judged by you, uh, are you unworthy to judge the small matters? Then it goes on. He said, so now he's saying, look at what he said. He said, you will judge the whole world. But right now, I want you to make a judgment in relation to a small situation, a matter that's taking place within the church. Do you see that? I want you to make a decision uh, pertaining to a, a, a challenge that's facing the church. He said, but that's not as far as your judgments are to go. The Bible said the spiritual are to judge all things, but he himself is not to be judged by any man's standard. So now he says that you're to judge the world. Do you know you're going to judge the world? So this is a small matter. So when he tells us to do a thing, that's a small thing compared to what God has uh, in store for us in the future. He says, but now, as it was in the garden, if you flunk the test in the garden, you're, you're, you're going to flunk it. Uh, you, you're, gonna, you're going to abdicate the authority given to you to actually exercise that authority over the whole earth and, and then over all of God's creation. So he says, not only that, are you unworthy to just smaller matters? He said, now he helps him to understand. He said, let me show you what I think about you. What is man that you're about to live? Do you not know uh, that you shall judge angels? Do you not know that you shall judge angels? He, he, the truth of the matter is, you, you say, but well, I never thought of that. I never gave consideration that what is happening now is posturing me to one day be in position to judge angels. So if I flunk judgment on this level, you best believe that I'm not postured to handle judgments on that level. And that's what God is saying. He said, so, so he's saying to you, even now, he says to me as a pastor, he said, he said, what are your judgments in relation to small matters? How are you handling? Uh, and you say, well, this is a large thing because we have to make decisions. He said, but how are you handling decisions on that level? He said, but the day will come when you'll have to judge angels. You'll be judging angels. Say, how much more things that, that pertain to? things that pertain to this life, how much more? Things that pertain to this life. He said, so your judgment concerning these things that pertain to this life is primary. That's just a starting point to get you to a place where you're gonna to have to make some very hard decisions in relation to angels, how angels were to function. So can you imagine, he has made you a little lower than the LOM. He's made you the Lord than the angels. He made you, but he has crowned you with glory and honor because the day will come when little man, this little finite creature, as weak as we are physically, and as I would say, as feeble as our minds are, fickle as we are, when we lean upon on, on this understanding, God will use man to judge angels. So, so what happened, this is proving time. This is ground for us to get it ready. If you can't manage a garden, you cannot be trusted in the management of the whole earth. If you cannot manage the earth, it will, you, uh, it, you will not be entrusted to judge the heavenlies. But he says, but the thing that I want to eventually bring you into doing is to judge the heavenlies. Now, now, when we think about that, that's a lot, isn't it? That's a large order that he's going to have us to call the shots in relation to uh, the, the angelic beings, the, the, those angels that existed long before man was created, those angels that oversee and overlook activities that's taking place. And then we look at the fallen angels. We will be the ones that will judge angels. Now, now, now look at, uh, as we think about this, what is interpreted, how do we interpret things? How do we see things? That's why it's important that uh, we, we are, have spiritual insight is because if, if, if we interpret things wrong or if we are spiritually blind, then we're not progressing in our understanding. You see, if you're spiritually blind. So, so, so the thing, that's what Paul was called to do. He said to open their eyes, to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, that they may receive an inheritance. You, you see, so, so what he's really saying is that I, I'm, I'm helping people not just to get them into church, not just to get them to join an organization or institution, but bring people to the place where they can make right judgments 
They can make sound judgments, godly decisions. That's the thing that God is trying to bring us into. So we can be brought to a place of making godly decisions so that the decision that God has made in relation to a particular thing, that thing is reflected through us. We begin to express the judgment of God upon the earth. We won't have our own uh, uh, leaning to our own understanding in relation to those things, but when we speak, we speak as the oracles of God. So now, if that's not the case, then our progress is, is hindered by that. And, and you're not making the kind of, you're, you're not growing as you ought to grow. But the more, you see, but when we understand this, then we're growing in grace and in the knowledge of God, we experience what's called accelerated growth. We're, we're not stymied in our development. And, and, and I would say that that's what, you, you see, that's why you can't have these light uh, uh, messages or uh, messages that doesn't really uh, challenge the heart or, or, or just pacify uh, the souls of those that are not willing and ready to move into deeper levels of, of, of Christ. But we have to be in a place where we say, Lord, uh, I, I want more of what you're offering me. And I want to know more of who you are because my assignment, you see, we talk about purpose. My assignment is much greater than just occupy space and time. But there are some things that I'm to do to make a difference in the lives of people. And, and, and understand this. That's what the gospel message is all about. It is to, uh, you talk about hope, it is a good, it is a message of good news to produce hope among all people, all people groups. It is saying that, you see, I, I can't be prejudiced in my thinking. I can't just be about black people. I just can't be about white people. I just can't be about uh, my particular denomination. But what happened, I, the good news must be good news to all people or it's not good news, to, it's not good news to any people. It has to be a comprehensive message that, that, that people will see a comprehensive Christ, not a black Christ or a white Christ, but a Christ that, 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 that has room to receive people of every people group. Uh, and understand, when there's no, uh, I would say that as we begin to look at what is happening in our uh, day, in our age, let me tell you something, we talk about small matters small matters. Did you not know that you will judge angels? Let's stop there for a moment. Do you not know that your thoughts affect what happens in the heavenlies? Did you not know that your actions affect what happens in the heavenlies? So we say that God has so arranged all of his creation. We talk about the heavens of the heavens. Then we talk about galaxies of galaxies. And then he places man in a position so that every, you must give an account for every careless word or deed that's done in your body. Because what happens, whatever we do upon the earth has an effect upon what happens in the heavenlies. We, we, we just had some warnings about tornadoes coming into our area. But you realize it, it, it's not coincidental that these things are happening as they're happening now. And it's not coincidental that uh, this is a time where we're facing these pandemics. And now we, we think that it, it appears as if things are coming under uh, some kind of control or it's being arrested to a degree because of the vaccines. But now we begin to see new strains being uh, uh, breaking out and all these things happening. Uh, it's happening at one time. But, but we cannot separate that from the activities of humanity upon the earth. It is the decisions that's being made upon the earth that's having an effect upon what takes place in the heavens. If we are to judge angels, if we are to judge angels, if we talk about angels who are limitless in their travel, angels who can, uh, you understand how angels function, angels who can, are strong and mighty and all of that, if we're to judge them, you best believe that our words, our deeds, our actions upon the earth have great significance upon the environment in which angels dwell. So we talk about the angels in heaven. What we're saying, what we're doing, will affect the, uh, the, the, the place where they dwell. So we say planetary arrangements. We talk about what's happening within the heavenlies. We begin to shift. I believe there are shifts taking place as a result of a law that's being passed, or laws that's being passed. 
when a person decides that we're going to we're going to do this because this is where I feel I feel about it. You best believe that there is a shift that takes place within the heavenlies as a result of the decision that's made upon the earth. And that's why we are facing many of the things that we're facing. I remember doing the Azusa Street Revival. They talked about, I think it was uh, Bart, uh, Bartlett was talking about the fact that uh, they were saying, does tornadoes or hurricanes have anything to do with sin? And he began to say that these things are taking place as a result of the sinfulness that had taken place within the day. And I would venture to say the same is happening today. When we become so sinful, and so uh, unconcerned about uh, what's happening, that things begin to shift and we become the uh, recipients of, of, of those particular things taking place among us. So, so it becomes, you see, there's no offset to the disease of sin. Now, now, now here's what I want you to look at scriptures to, to help you understand what the scripture says. Here in Psalm 139 and verse 23, this is what the uh, psalmist said. He says, search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my anxieties. Let's stop there for a moment. Search me, O God. Search me, scrutinize me, look inside of me, search me, and know my heart. Wait a minute, I thought I already knew my heart. To him that I see, uh, the, the greatest knowledge is to know myself. No, he says, Lord, you search me and reveal to me the position of my heart. Show me the kind of heart that resides within me. Search me and know my heart. And then he says, try me. Now, now, that's a strong order. Try me. Put me to the test so that whatever's inside of me will come out so that I might be aware of it and know my anxieties. Look at the connection here. Try me and know my anxieties. Now, we talk about anxieties. Let's look at it this way. Know my anxious thoughts. Know my anxious thoughts. These anxious thoughts, they come to mind as a result of trials. When I'm tried, what are the anxious thoughts that come to mind? What are the things that surface as a, result of as a result of pressure being brought to bear against me? Try me. In other words, Lord, how will I function under pressure? Uh, when, 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 when couples are dating and they're putting their best foot forward, uh, you, you know, all did that, didn't we? Put your best foot forward and all, every time, you, uh, uh, would you like, uh, yes, it's fine with me and everything is fine and dandy. And he said, no, I want to see how you function under pressure. I want to see how you handle disagreements. How do you handle when things, when, when things are, when, when, we're at, at, when we're at odds with one another? How do you handle it? Are you violent at that particular moment? Do you blow up steam to the point that my life is in danger? You see, if that be the case, we even give a, a, a test on that. Uh, we want to know, your, you know your, how you may function. A particular in a particular situation. So so uh, here he said. He said so. Try me and know my anxieties. Anxieties, my anxious thoughts, leading to now these ancient thoughts oftentimes lead to depression, hyperactivity because a person gets very depressed. He said, "Try me, know my anxieties, uh, uh, Lord. What are the things that make me depressed? What are the things that make me hyperactive?" And as a result of it, a lot of people that are operating when the anxieties have anxious thoughts, they, they, they medicate themselves, you see, often medicate themselves. At other times, they engage in sporadic activities. They just might do anything. They just might you, you, they go out and sow wild oats or, or just do crazy stuff. He says, so try me and know my anxieties. How do I function under pressure? Uh, moodiness. You know the things that cause me to be moody, the things that caused me to get into a rut. He said, what are those things? And, 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 and then try me so that my life, I, I, I don't want to be unpredictable. I don't want to be in a place where I'm unpredictable. I just might do anything. But try me and know that. And then he says, when you do all of that, I want you to see if there's any wicked way in me. Because when the pressure comes, it will Either it will bring out what's inside of you. He says, but you see if there's any wicked way in me. I'm not going to tell you 
that there's no wicked way in me, but I want you to see it yourself. Because I could tell you that, just like Peter told him, yeah, I'll never forsake you. He, as Jesus said, before the rooster crowed three times, you would betray me three times. He said, so you don't know what's inside. You said, I will never do this. I'll never do that. Well, well, you don't know what you might do or might not do under pressure. He said, but the Lord does because he is the maker of all things. He knows all things. He said, so try if there's any wicked way in me. He said, and then lead me. Now, this is surrender. Lead me in the way everlasting. Lead me in the way everlasting. It is saying, so Lord, so I don't want my reactions to, to, over, uh, to, to overrule uh, whatever may be that which you develop within me that will uh, be there for everlasting life, be there forever. So that when I rule uh, and judge over angels, I will be in position to do so. Because I want you to get this stuff out of me now so that it does not, uh, so that it's not there, so that I qualify and I'm equipped to handle things after uh, this particular phase of life is over. So he says, so I want you to lead me the way everlasting. So, so all of our tests, all of our trials, all of our challenges, all of it's a test, it's preparation for what we have in store for us, even in the future, because he starts from the small to the large. But then his objective, God has knowledge of the end before the beginning. So in this, if we're not careful, we take matters into our own hands. Or if you take manage matters in your own hands, it becomes self-management, self-managed. That's when you begin to say, well, I have it. I got it. No, you don't have it. You'll make a mess of it. You see, people thinking and like to feel that they're in control of every situation. Uh, and, and when you, uh, if you're in control of the situation, yet uh, your your life then is out of control. You say, well, I can control the situation. What about your life? Your life is out of control. So, so what we need as we begin to look at the psalmist, he said, now if you go to 139, and let's go to the earlier part of that, 139 and 1. It says, oh, Lord, you have searched me and known me. Now, now, he says before that, he says, search me. And he says this after it, really. He says, search me and know me. But before that, he says, you have searched me and known me. He says, you have already searched me and you have already known me. He said, what do you know about me, Lord? You know my sitting down and you know my rising up. You understand my thoughts are far off. You comprehend my path and my lying down, and you are acquainted with all of my ways. Now, we talk about our ways. We talked about the ways, moodiness, hyperactivity, and all the other. It said the Lord is acquainted with all your ways. He, he knows. Just, I was thinking about that today. I said, Lord, you know how I respond to certain things. Sometimes I don't like the way I respond to certain things. I said, but Lord, I'm submitting that to you so that I'm giving you permission to work this out of me so that I can respond to matters the way you would have me to respond. Because I realize that my assignment is not just here on earth, but my assignment is, is eternal. So now, you're acquainted with all of my ways, God. You see, but are you knowledgeable? You see, knowledgeable of the fact that God understands uh, your, your ways, your ways, the way you handle things, the way you do things, the way you manage your life. Uh, whatever excuse you may give, God, don't, don't give yourself any more excuses, but be in a place where you, you, you begin to say, Lord, uh, I, I want you to take any wicked way out of me. I'm no longer searching for an excuse, but I'm saying, Lord, I'm asking you to take out of me whatever you see that ought not be here. You, you see that? And that's, and, and, and the reason, here's what we talk about. He says, you have searched me and known me. You're created with all my ways. You know my, uh, all the things that's going on in my life. Because that's really dealing with the omniscience of God. God being omniscient. Omniscient means he is all-knowing. That word, he is all-knowing. God is all-knowing in, in, in the sense that he is aware of the past, the present, and the future. Nothing takes God by surprise. God never is surprised, and he is never alarmed. He never says, oops, 
I said that before. His knowledge is total. He knows all that there is to know and all that can be known. That's the God, his omniscience. God has full knowledge of all things. Now, now in the message, this is how the message puts Psalm 139 and verse one. It says, uh, God investigate, and I put down scrutinize my life. Investigate my life, investigate. It says, Lord, you have searched me. I would say, Lord, you have investigated, you have scrutinized my life. He says, get all the facts firsthand. I'm an open book to you. Even from a distance, you know what I'm thinking. You know where, when I leave and when I get back, I'm never out of your sight. You know everything I'm going to say before I start the first sentence. I love the way uh, Eugene Peterson puts it. Before I open my mouth, you know what's about to come out of it. Lord, you already know how I'm going to, what I'm going to say before I say it. And, and, and here's this whole thing of surrender is we get to a place you say, so since you know it, Lord, and since I don't know it, I need someone to come in so that those things are under the right control. That's why we need a mediator, a mediator. We talk about that. He says, what is man that you're mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him? First Timothy 2, 5 says, for there is one God and one mediator between God and men. That's the man, Christ Jesus. What is man? the son of man that you visit him. So we see the man, the human being, the man, Christ Jesus, God in the flesh. We see God in the flesh coming as a mediator so that as he search us and know us, that he is there to work out of us those things that he wants to get that, that should not be there so that we can become who he intends for us to become. So now, I'm almost, I, I want to deal with image. I want to deal with image for a while because you understand that we are made in the image of God. I want to really emphasize that part. We are made in the image of God. We see God in creation and he said, let us make man in our own image after our own likeness. But then we bring Christ into the picture and we'll begin to understand something of image. What was he really getting at when he says that he made man in the image of God? So we begin, look at that image again. Let's go back to, let's go to Hebrews chapter 11, verse three. It says, by faith, we understand that the worlds, that we're worlds again. When it says worlds, universes, the, the vastness of God's creation, the universes were framed by the word of God. So we see the universes, we see the galaxies, we see all of those were framed by the word of God. He says, so that things which are seen were not made of things which are visible. So now we see the God making something out of nothing. God creating, God is a creator. I started with that, God is a creator. He makes something out of nothing nothing. So now we begin to see him that the worlds, the, the galaxies, that which is called space was made by and through the word of God. God said, let there be, and those things became. So now let's look at what God was doing. He says, so now we see him becoming, making visible those things that would otherwise be invisible. First John, well, John, St. John, chapter one, verse one, in the beginning was the word. In, uh, let, let's look at it. Before the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through him and without him, nothing was made that was made. So now we see him. From the beginning, all things were made through him. So what happened, it came forth through him. And then if you go to the 18th verse, it says, 
No one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God. So now we're still dealing with the invisible. We deal with the invisible portions of creation, how God created something out of nothing, and then the things that are invisible are made visible by him. But then he says, no one has seen God at any time. But he says, but the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father has declared him or manifested him or made him known because he is the express image of the father. He is the express image of the father. That's the point we're making uh, uh, here. He is the image of the invisible God. So let's look at this whole thing of image. God was made, man was made in the image of God. The word image, the word image, we have a word that's familiar to you. In fact, it's icon, but it's spelled E-I-K-O-N, but we have our word icon. And that word involves two ideas. One is representation and the other is manifestation. You see, two ideas are illustrated here. One is representation, and the other is manifestation. So it says, so he is the representative of God, but he is also the manifestation of God. So he represents him, but he makes him known. So you see, in other words, he stands, he is God in the flesh, but, but yet he makes the God that is unknown known. And then when we are made in his image, we're not, uh, you see, we make known the God that is unknown, even through uh, our functioning as God would have us to function. He says, so that's why, and I'll get to this later on, why it's so important that our lives be such that we express it in the right thing. Not that he is uh, just like God, but he was made to express the personhood of God. That's the image. We talk about icon. We become the icon because we, we uh, express the very personhood of God. Uh, you see, uh, Colossians puts it this way. He is the image, Colossians 1.15, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created through him and for him, and he is before all things, and in him all things consist. Now look at this. All things hold their consistency as a result of, of him being before all things and what he has made known of the Father God. In other words, I want you to put it this way. Look at it this way. Things maintain their consistency when, when God is made known through Jesus Christ. But then let's look at us now. Things maintain their consistency when we make Christ known, who then makes the Father known. So what happens, the icon. So it says that the image of God, the image of God that is to be expressed through humanity postures all things that have been created to maintain their consistency. That's what it's really saying here. And he is a head of the body of the church, because we see the church now, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. So it is saying that it is the position of the church and the posture of the church to maintain consistency within the world. So that's a strong, tall order that God has given us. In other words, he has placed that responsibility in our hands. He says, when we, in other words, that's why the church has to be the church. We have to be who God has called us to be. So that when we step into our rightful place as the church, that's why it's so dangerous. Let me tell you something. Whether you like a particular thing or not, fallen humanity has uh, a certain, let, let's say, uh, the preconditions, uh, let's say the preconditions of sin, let's say the effects of sin, fallen nature of humanity, that, that people have an affinity towards certain things. He says, so whatever your affinity may be towards, but when you come to an understanding, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God. Once you get that understanding, then you desire to see God's order established, even though 
your personal preference may be different. You say, Lord, so again, search my heart. Take out of me whatever that thing may be within me that's contributing to the disorder so that your order may be established upon the earth. So as we see these things happening, if you see it in the proper light, I believe there'll be many people that will begin to despise sin because they'll see the effects of sin that's causing all the things that you dislike to occur within the earth. Now, now I'm almost done. I just have, we say they hold their preeminence, they hold their consistency because of Christ. That's why the world hates Christ. The world, worldliness hates Christ. The thing that's standing away, you think about it, is is it is heating up right now. The the animosity, hatred towards Christ is brewing like never before. And and what's happening? It said the thing that's standing in the way of people being their own person and doing their own thing is Jesus Christ, who is absolute. He keeps talking about his absoluteness. That, that he is the truth. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And no one can come to the Father, not through all the other sources or means, but it must be through Jesus Christ. You see, when you speak that absolute, you're making enemies and people begin to pull in different directions. It's not a white Jesus or a black Jesus, but understand that it is a Jesus Christ who loves all people and is involved in bringing out the best that uh, ought to be in all people, placing it within them, and then bringing them into their full, this, their full purpose. So now, in closing, and I have to deal with this later because this is one of the most important parts. We look at what God is doing uh, and desire to do with the church. Uh, Romans chapter 8, verse 20. He said, for the whole creation was subjected in futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. Futility. Look at this word, futility. Incapable of producing any useful result. Incapable of producing any useful result. In other words, pointless. It said the whole creation became pointless, futility, pointless. Your life becomes pointless. Oh, I can't wait to go deeper into this. You see that? Your life, uh, uh, your, your, your relationship is pointless. What's the point in you being together? What is the purpose for your being together? What, what, are, you, what are you to produce? You, you see the lack of productivity. What are you producing? Male, male, female, female. What are you going to produce in that? And if the church agrees, I'm, I, I'm okay. The world will go that way because the world doesn't know any better. But I'm speaking to the church, primarily to the church. Praise God that the Pope has changed courses, or at least it, uh, is, is, it, uh, he's expressing the fact that marriage is between a man and a woman. But understand, those who bow down to uh, the cultural gods of Baal, they, they, they compromise the standard of God, and they're contributing to the the, the, the morass that's taking place within society today. Not only, it, it is sin that is reproach to every people. The, the, the things that's happening, the climate that's being set is a result of sin. So now, pointless. What is the point? We are the image of God. We are the image of God. God's objective is to give expression to who he is through those that represent him and manifest him. And that's his church. That's who we are. There are some that, like I said, you're spinning your wheels if all you're doing is having circular activities where you're just having church services and not challenging people to become all that God would have them to become and challenging their lifestyles to the degree that they see the necessity of Christ coming inside of them and correcting those things that need to be corrected, you see. So I'm closing by saying, Lord, search me and know me. Try the reins of my heart and anything you see in me, take it out so that you can be glorified. You can see the reflection of yourself in me. I pray this prayer for myself, but I also pray this prayer for you that we become the glory reflectors of Jesus Christ in this generation 
The world is in desperate need of seeing Christ in this world today. And the only ones that can display him are the ones that are called by his name, but yet committed to his purpose. So Father, we thank you for your word. We give you the honor, we give you the praise and all the glory for what you're making known to us. And may as we, your people, take to heart the assignment given. And may we know ourselves through knowing you, through knowing your son. And that's the only identity that we want. When we know you for who you are, then we become dissatisfied with ourselves as we currently are. And our desire is for you to express all that you are through us, through your son. So thank you for this opportunity that you've given us. This is the antidote to violence. This is the antidote to all of the things that we see taking place on the street, is having this understanding and comprehension of who you are and understanding how it's to be applied to every area and every aspect of our lives. So in this, we give you the honor, we give you the praise, and you receive the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Praise God. Praise God. I trust that you heard with your heart what the Spirit is saying to us. I have much more to say on this subject as with the other subjects ministered recently, but we're taking it step by step and I'm just trying to be sensitive to the voice of God so that what I share with you is what God would have me to share with you within the time that is to be shared. Uh, there are threats this evening, uh, weather threats, tornadoes, threats, and he's saying that it's good to buckle down and bunker down rather, bunker down to make sure that you are taking the precautions, not being foolish in relation to that, uh, taking any precautions that's necessary. But at the same time, we trust God and we pray your protection over your lives as uh, uh, whatever is happening within the weather, that it, we pray that it will pass over. We pray that it will pass over those of us who are, are, are trusting God and, and, and asking God to show more of himself to us. And in this, we just pray that the message that is being delivered through the stars will be received by those that lack understanding, to know the contribu contrib contributing factors to these things that's happening in our day and our time. So we praise God for that. If you're not saved, we pray that you come to know the Lord. That's the only place that's safe. You see things can happen just like that in a moment's notice. Uh, it's been, we, you can be here today and gone tomorrow. Things, having things today and those things gone tomorrow. Health, to healthy today and not healthy tomorrow. Things can happen, but understand that our safety is in him because when our lives in Christ, whatever happens physically, that's just physical. But the enemy cannot touch our spirits and our souls once we've committed that to the Lord completely. So I'm challenging you, this culture, this time when things are happening and falling apart all around us, that you come into the ark of safety. safety. The only safe place is in Christ. And I'm not talking about in institutions, but in Christ, but yet be a part of a people group that's committed to the cause of Christ. So if that's you and You've not given your life to Christ. We're going to pray with you now. And we ask you to pray this. And, and even after you pray it, you may have to pray it by yourself silently uh, in, in your quiet time, even after you might have prayed publicly with me. But I want it to be sincere, earnest, from the depths of your heart, because you can say things after me. Unless there's sincerity, uh, it, it won't have the same impact. But just pray this. So, Father, I recognize my need for a Savior, and I accept Jesus Christ as my Lord. I believe that you raised him from the dead, but he died for what I deserved. And in that, I thank you that the price of my sin has been paid for. My sin debt has been paid. And now, Lord, as I received Christ into my life, I'm now a new creature because you raised him from the dead. And it's that resurrection life that's now making me alive. 
So I give you the honor, praise, and glory in Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed it, meant it. Welcome to the family of God. And he's, Jesus is here to baptize you in the Holy Spirit. Yes, you will speak in tongues. You'll glorify the Lord. And you'll have a boldness. The joy of the Lord will be yours as you begin to ask the Lord to baptize in your spirit. But my testimony is that he doesn't dwell in an unclean temple. Uh, when you surrendered your life to the Lord, make sure that you surrender it all. Make sure you surrender it all. Say to the Lord things that you need to, uh, things that need to give up. I, I count the value of him coming to your life as being greater than whatever might have had value in the past. And once you make that kind of uh, stand in that position, he will baptize you in the spirit. And you'll know it. No one have to tell you. You'll know that the Lord has come on the inside of you. And uh, not with the church home, if you're without a church home, you want to become a part of us. We're here to love you and to minister to you that you may grow in grace, the knowledge of the Lord. Amen. Amen. And we are looking forward to our uh, time together. If uh, And I mentioned, I mentioned to my staff and I mentioned to my wife a minute ago, we're still not so foolish as to believe if things begin to turn in a different direction, then we will have to take the necessary precautions in the future. I was listening tonight. It was saying that because of the fact that people are spring breaks and, and uh, celebrations, St. Patrick's Day and like, that people are just kind of throwing caution to the wind, which could become uh, wide spreaders. It could cause these diseases to uh, become even more rampant. And if those kinds of things occur, then by all means, we're going to take the necessary precautions again. But in the meantime, we're looking forward to, 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 to uh, Easter, to Resurrection Sunday, as we come together, those that have signed up uh, we just look forward to our time together as we worship together on Easter Sunday. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts now to give unto the Lord as we honor him uh, through giving with our tithes, those that are part of this ministry, and those under this covering, those that desire to be under this covering. Uh, we solicit your tithes, tenth. That's what tithe means, a tenth. But it's not paying, it's giving. It, it's, a, it's coming to the place where you willfully give that as a measure and beyond that an offering unto the Lord and that offering is all can participate in that if this ministry is making a difference in your life you've heard something that's making an impact upon your life then by all means may be uh, of such that you want to see the message widespread that you're wanting to be a part of communicating the gospel message so that as many as possible might receive it so, Father, thank you for this opportunity as we present to you our gifts, our tithes, our offerings, that which represent our time, our talent, and our treasure. And we thank you for this opportunity. We rejoice in this because we count it a privilege that we can be a part of that which is eternal, that which is glorious, that which you're doing, that's making a difference in many lives. So we give you the honor, we give you the praise, and we give you all the glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Praise God for you. And we look forward to Sunday morning as we come together again uh, to worship. And it's a worship, a time to worship the Lord. Yes, you hear the word of the Lord, but then don't just come to the part, my part of it, when I'm ministering the word, but the songs, the time when the worship leaders leading us in song, join in, be a part of the worship experience. Pray ahead of time. Have your heart prepared so that when we worship, we worship together as one. And we praise God for the opportunity that even though we are distanced, we're still together as a worship, a company of believers that worship the Lord in spirit and in truth. So may the Lord's blessings be upon your lives as you, as we depart from this place. We speak blessings, we speak peace, protection, over your people, even during this time of storm. We give you the honor and the glory and all the praise for who you are, because you lord over all things. And in this, Lord, you lord over us. 
So we thank you and we give you all the praise in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless. And we'll see you Sunday, or you'll see me Sunday morning.